Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian McCollum with the official museum gloves on, joined today once again by Jonathan Ferguson, uh, who is author of the upcoming headstamp book, uh, Thornycroft to SA-80 British Bullpup Rifles, 1901 to 2018, right? That's right, yeah. But you actually kind of go like a little bit later into 2019 and a little bit earlier into like 1860s. The dates are a bit of a bit of a constraint sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but the, the focus is on the, the chapters cover those dates, but inevitably there are earlier things, and the SA-80 isn't going away. So, so right now I will say the book is currently available for pre-sale on Kickstarter. Check it out. We have a link in the description text. So what we're going to do today specifically is we have this EM2, and all the EM2s like kind of look the same, unless you're a person like Jonathan who has spent significant time actually studying them. And I get this with French rifles. Yeah. Like, well, the Vertiers are the same. I'm like, oh, they're not even remotely close to the same. Yeah. Well, uh, today, you're going to show us what is different about this one, and what is it, and why. Because there's actually a tremendous amount of variation within the EM2. There is. So, um, unless you have any introduction that you want to give us right here, you can go ahead and take this back to the table and get a close look at it. Let's get into it. All right. Um, what, is, what are the major different elements, the major different types of EM2s if they're not all the same? There are a, <laughs> about four specific um, variants. There's two, <laughs> Rifle 280, which is the original, uh, Rifle 280 EM2, uh, which is the first, what, what I guess, we, <laughs> we tend to call everything EM2. Technically, only that one is the EM2. Hmm. Um, but it's almost irrelevant because the guys developing it call everything EM2 as well. So it's legitimate to call them all EM2s. Um, that's 280. Um, the cartridge goes through a number of, of changes, uh, morphs into, uh, it's, it's, firstly it's renamed metrically as 7mm, and specifically 7mm HV is what emerges from trials and from, from trying to make the thing meet American needs. So primarily? It's, it's high velocity, right? High velocity. And yeah. they extend the cartridge case length? Yep. You go, you're going up to 49.5 millimeters case length, so you're really knocking on the door of 762 by 51, right. which is not coincidental. Um, that then means you have to lengthen the body of the gun. And so, uh, without going into all of the different variants, because there are sort of sub-variants as well, um, what we get in 1952 so this is, this is when the politicians and everyone else is kind of arguing and the thing is starting to falter. The 280, the rifle 280, which is <laughs> adopted for about eight months, mm -hmm. 1951, April 1951, as rifle number nine, Mark I, uh, and the cartridge uh, along with it. Uh, that goes effectively away, <laughs> and they refocus on two new variants. So we have prototypes for those. Uh, in the collection and elsewhere. So 7mm HV and 30, what we call 30 short, confusingly. Yeah, what is that? 7.62 by 51. Or rather, T65, right. the prototype for 7.62 by 51. That makes sense in context with 30 caliber being 30 on 6. Yes. Okay. Exactly. It's, it's, in our minds, it's like 30 on 6, but short. Right. So <laughs> um, what's this one? So, well, so, so that then, you end up with two parallel branches. So we've already adopted rifle number nine under the old system, number and mark. We then have brought in an early version of the NATO experimental system, or our version of it, X1E1, and that's the seven millimeter HV chambered gun, so the British compromise cartridge. And then the X2E1, which is this 30 short, or 7.62 by 51, or T65 version, and that's what's sitting in front of us. Okay. How can you tell the difference? <laughs> well, unhelpfully, they never marked these X designations, or for that matter, rifle number nine, on the guns. Okay. Um, incidentally, I should mention the, there was a provisional adoption of X1E1 as rifle number 10 Mark I. Huh. Okay. Provisional adoption, not the actual real adoption that did happen in 1951. So, it has two names. Now, that was clearly going nowhere, and within a few months, really, 1952-ish, uh, well, during 1952, I should say, they're all getting rechambered 
So they all become X2E1s. Okay. okay. So, sorry. 280 slash 30 and 7 millimeter HZ are the same thing? No. Okay. Of course not. 280 slash 30 is 7 by 43 with an extractor groove and case head profiled okay. to fit the T65. Okay. So it's 280 British. Yeah. Well, we don't, the, the British thing is unofficial. Yeah, okay. 280, and then from that comes 280-30. Yep. And then it gets lengthened from 43 to 49 and a half. Yep. And you get 7 millimeter HV. Yep. Which is also, that's like British um, uh, compromise. 7 millimeter compromise. 7 millimeter compromise is a different cartridge. Okay. So it's 7 HV <laughs> and 7 compromise. <laughs> And then T65. Yep. Okay. Yep. I'm sure um, viewers are familiar with things like rifle number four, SMLE, uh, where the actual designation of the weapon is on the weapon. Nice and convenient. You know what you're looking for. Count the stars. <laughs> right. Um, we've by this point moved to the X number E number system of experimental numbering, which translates to L number okay. A number. Okay. For the adopted version, hence L1A1. Okay. So, <laughs> what we have in front of us, if things in a parallel universe, would have been rifle L1A1. Right. It's an obvious thing to say, but people might not have thought about it. Now, what we see in front of us here is EN109 Enfield. EN is one of the several serial number runs for variants of the EM2. Uh, EN being Enfield, mm -hmm. so it's kind of redundant. Uh, and then the name Enfield, name of the factory, obviously below it, which is somewhat traditional. You know, we, every factory that made British firearms tended to put its name right. on the gun. So they didn't make 109 of these, did they? No. <laughs> they made 15 of these. Okay. Uh, EN 100 to EN 114. Uh, and interestingly, the only two EM, two, well, yeah, in the, in, in the United States, the only two EM2s are this one here at the Cody Firearms Museum, and one at uh, Springfield Armory. Um, both, well, that's, that was a presentation example. Um, this one is believed to have come over with Stefan Kenneth Jansen, as his name was anglicized to, and I'm not going to attempt to pronounce his original name. <laughs> Which was Polish. Polish, that's right, yeah. Um, one of a number of uh, imported firearms designers at the time. <laughs> Uh, so, so he um, came over to work for Winchester huh. in the 50s. Okay. And therefore, is thought to have been given his personal EM2 and brought it with him, which might explain why this is in such fantastic condition. Right. Yeah, he didn't go through uh, an endurance trial or a combat trial in Malaya or anything. <laughs> so um, let's take a quick look at a couple of the, the operating features here. Uh, for a magazine release, We've got a lever on the back with that. I assume all of these controls were pretty much standardized, or did the, they change? This is the, I have to say confusion, but when you look, like anything else, when you look in detail, you start, start to see the differences. And if you put them all side by side, you really do see the differences. So very little changed, actually, in the development of the EM2 from, from 19, well, 49, definitely, when it's a, when it's a real thing, um, to the end of the whole, Sorry, Saga. Mm -hmm. Not much changes, you know. The controls, unlike the SA80, the controls change in detail only. So that mag catch is very subtly different from the one on EM2 slash rifle number nine. Uh, the magazine, as, as we're seeing here, has now lost the uh, charger stripper clip guide at the back. Right, that's what this big lump is for, is it originally yeah. had its own self-contained stripper clip guide. Yeah, which is a nice idea. Yeah. Adds a little bit of weight, adds cost. Mm -hmm. And let's remember that by the time of X2E1, cost is becoming an issue. Because uh, we need to make this thing as cheaply as possible because the FAL is cheaper to make by a significant margin. And this is a 20 round magazine. That's right, 20 rounds, which, yeah, I mean, for, for a, this is on the high end of intermediate cartridges. So it's a bulky cartridge. You could, of course, have gone for a, for a high capacity mag later on, as happens in many many firearms um, designs over time. 20 rounds, let's not forget, in 1951, or 50, 52, 53 in this case, is still twice what you had in the Uli Enfield. 
so of the many subtle changes made over time between the original um, EM2 rifle number nine to the X2E1 that we have here, the most critical by far is to lengthen the receiver. And okay. the, the four or five, depending on where you draw the line, main variants of the gun break down into long body and short body. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to a researcher by the name of Ian Patrick in the UK, who's done most of the work on this for me. Um, otherwise, my head might have exploded. <laughs> um, so now, you think, okay, so 762, it's going to be significantly longer. It's only half an inch longer. Okay. So that's actually relatively hard to spot without a, two mags together, without two guns together. Um, and therefore, did not substantially increase the weight. Okay. It put it a little further over the eight pound weight limit that they'd set and already exceeded with rifle number nine. But that's no longer critical now that we're fighting for the survival of this gun. The cartridge is dead. We need a 7.62 EM2. Who cares? Okay. <laughs> but that is critical and it means a new forging, uh, in fact, every every component, I think I'm right in saying, every component on this version is different. Wow. But it's not materially different. Right. Design's the same, but the dimensions are just changed enough that you can't use the same tool to make it. I think I'm right in saying that, and that's similar to the number four from e, from SM, SMLE, number rifle number mm -hmm. one, change. Same basic weapon, redimensioned to make it easier to make. In this case, they aren't really value engineering it, as the term is put, um, they are more accommodating the cartridge and incorporating lessons learned from user trials, operational trials as well, which is interesting. All right, now how about the actual firing controls? Safety and selective, um, what's the setup? Nothing changes, they're quite happy with that. Uh, separate controls, as you noted in your original video, um, rip off of the M1 Garand, I think it's safe to say, uh, for good reason, you know, why, why mm -hmm. not? Uh, not the only one to do that. Around that safety is also a reprofiled trigger guard. Okay. So the original is much squarer. This is um, curving up at the front. Uh, slightly, I don't know if that's an aesthetic change. If they wanted to reduce the size because of safety concerns, there's no evidence for that. Okay. And then the selector is, if they ripped off the safety from the M1, they ripped off the selector from the Sturm. Kind of. This is a bit like the arguments um, with the Sturmgewehr and the AK, uh, where you have intermediate stages where they absolutely did rip off features, mm -hmm. and then they unripped them off later. So, okay. so well, you, the, and the functionality is the same, absolutely okay. the same. But the design of the component go in this sort of simple tubular metal shape, yeah, that's like the Sturmgewehr, but the earlier EM2s have a much nicer checkered, mm. solid button. Okay. So they, they are starting to simplify, but only a bit. Okay. And this is semi-auto in one position and full auto. That's right. No burst system or anything. Ever. No burst system was even conceived of at this stage. That's thoughtful of them. <laughs> With all of these, the major assemblies being um, basically the opportunity to redesign them, they're incorporating improvements, um, perhaps production streamlining, but it's not that evident apart from some of the small control, some of the controls. But this um, center section of the receiver, because this is constructed from more than one piece, that's right, mm -hmm. that's now a, a straight a, a straight tapered cone, if, if I can put it that way. Previously it's shaped, it almost, it's almost shaped like the cartridge. Hmm. So I guess it's a bit weaker, and they've beefed it up in this area to handle uh, what becomes 762 by 51 the T65 cartridge. Okay. So a little visual distinction there as well between the patterns. Can help you identify if, if you're trying to work out what you're looking at. Yeah. The unit site, uh, which incidentally is, um, <laughs> as far as I can tell, the expression unit site is a little bit esoteric these days, uh, means a unitary optic. Okay. In other words, not a front sight and a rear sight, a unit site. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, as far as I can tell. This is the kind of thing no one spells out. But um, The actual unit sight does not change. It's that little tiny, what looks like a telescope, but isn't. It's a fixed power uh, sight. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting that in most pictures from the side, you can't really tell that this kind of conical looking optic is actually just a metal shield around this little tiny, like quarter inch in diameter, single power non-magnifying optical sight. So here we're looking in the very front. Um, and this, you said this didn't change at all between the patterns? The sight didn't change. Uh, 
there'll be slight differences perhaps in the pressing that the or the stamping that the shield is made out of, but um, I'm not even sure of that. I think it's the same thing all the way through. Um, and uh, yeah, you mentioned that the size and weight of well, the size of the thing. It's super light for an optic. Um, yeah. I mean, for the time and for now. And yeah, the SA80 already a heavy gun. You put the SUSAT on there, it's it's a real boat anchor. So this kept the gun light, which was, you know, they were trying to reach eight pounds, they slightly overshot, but this is the main reason they kept it down. They didn't put a great big bulky optic on it. The optic not changing is, is one thing. Um, the carry handle does change frequently. There are mm -hmm. numerous variations of it, um, including an adjustable, a user adjustable one, which mm -hmm. wasn't really used, as far as we can tell, but they did trial that out. The What you're seeing at the rear there, the uh, windage and elevation, yeah. jack screws essentially, as you can probably tell, are not meant to be user adjustable. This thing is zeroed at a, at a range, as you would normally do, and that's it. So only if it goes out of alignment do you get the armorer to adjust your carry handle and therefore the angle of your optic. The actual form of that casting, or forging, um, changes over time in, in ways that aren't particularly interesting. <laughs> what, what is interesting is that big flange at the front. Right up in here. Yeah. Um, which is not something that leaps out, maybe, but it, it, you immediately start thinking, what the hell is that for? <laughs> well, clearly that's there so that when you run the charging handle back, you smash your thumb on that thumb smashing flange. Case closed. That's definitely what it's for. I've done that at least four times. It's immensely painful. Yes, as have I. <laughs> this is the problem of using modern day drills or manual arms and transplant transplanting them back in time when they weren't wanted. <laughs> so you're doing just about everything on this rifle with your right hand, including cocking the thing. There's a lot of inertia um, or mechanical uh, disadvantage, I guess, to overcome with the locking flaps when right. you, you pull back on the charging handle. So it, it, you, you're pulling, you're pulling, it doesn't go, it doesn't go, and suddenly it goes. And if you're trying to cock it overhand or with the wrong hand, you're going to whack yourself. Yeah. Big time. So what was the actual purpose of that <laughs> extended flange? So the actual purpose was, we believe, because again, this isn't written down, this is a common problem with, with sort of primary research, it's a gas shield. Ah, uh, okay. For the, so this cocking handle slot, when that operating rod slash cocking handle comes back, it's a bit like fire, firing an AR with a suppressor. You're getting mm. hot gases in the face. And this was noted in trials. And the only real purpose for this flange can be to act as a deflector shield, a bit like a brass deflector, which the weapon has as well, to divert the worst of that hot gas away from the shooter's face. Okay. At the front end of the gun, we've got changes to the gas block um, and the cocking tube. Now, these aren't necessarily changes from the last model, but they're changes over time from the original design. The original cocking tube was super thin and easily deformed, and on some examples, you can see where it's beating itself to death. So they changed that, reinforced it, and the gas block was, was also reprofiled at the same time. The major change is, well, it's not even a major change, um, but the visible change. If you're trying to identify an X2E1, and this would apply to an X1E1 as well, is the form of the handguard. It's only when you compare them that you go, oh, that's completely different. So this is a one-piece handguard um, with the, sometimes described as like a grenade-shaped grip. Well, on the earlier EM2, it really is a separate looking part. Um, this is kind of morphed and blended into the, into the single piece of wood. That makes sense. Okay. And um, the grooves are a different profile. The early handguard had a, a screw coming up from the bottom, which caused all sorts of problems in the trials in the States. Uh, the recoil forces broke the screw. Oh. So they made a much more robust bracket system inside with a transverse screw. That's quite an early change, though. So yeah, um, not, not functionally any different. Ergonomically, not really any different. But they made the change nonetheless. Okay. Well, there you go. More than you ever thought you needed to know about identifying specific characteristics on an EM2. So uh, I would definitely like to thank the Cody Firearms Museum. This EM2 is here in their collection. Where, uh, if you are visiting at the, <laughs> if you were visiting and there was a little sign up that said, "Sorry, this is uh, down and out of the exhibition at the moment," it's because it's 
here, and we're filming it right now. But uh, when you come in to, to visit the Cody Firearms Museum, this is one of the thousands and thousands of guns that they have on display. Uh, really a tremendous collection and a tremendous museum. And a big thanks to them for letting us pull this down and uh, show you guys all the details on it. And, of course, if you're interested in finding out more about the EM series or the SA-80 series or the Thornycroft or a bunch of other really interesting uh, British bullpup rifles that you may not even realize are out there, check out Jonathan's brand new book. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it is currently up uh, for pre-sale on Kickstarter. We have a link to that Kickstarter sale in the description text below. Uh, the price is a little reduced during the pre-sale, and there's some cool extra goodies that you can get by being part of that pre-sale. So if you're interested, absolutely check that out. And uh, until next time, thank you for watching.